Well, welcome, welcome, welcome as people come and join in. It is an absolute pleasure to see so many of your uh, your names on here. Some of them I I recognize. Some of them are brand new. Um, very excited to to have you here today. Uh, we're gonna give it just another moment as the doorbell continues to to ring on me, um, as a few more people kind of slowly slowly jump in here. Ding, ding, ding. All right. All right. Don't forget that the chat is open. Um, if you'd like, go ahead and open it up now. Tell uh, tell people where you're calling from, what your business is. Um, the more the more information I have, even about you know your industry, the type of company that you work for, the easier it is for me to adjust the information or the examples to suit your particular industries um, going forward. So it is an absolute pleasure to, to uh, have you all here. Now, we've done an update on this presentation for those of you that uh, have not seen this one in a while or maybe have seen this one before. When uh, back in the days when people used to meet face to face, um, we actually did this as a lunch and learn. It was um, oftentimes in an in-person type of event. Um, since that period of time, we've had a lot of adjustments to, um, to the way that we're releasing our content, but I'm also challenged challenging both myself and my team to make sure that we're offering the very best every single time. So I made, not that I didn't think that the previous 10 questions were very valuable. I just thought that there was even more valuable questions that we could potentially be asking, as well as some questions that we could ultimately avoid, which is brand new to this conversation. Hello, Jim. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Cecilia. It is great to see you as well. Um, so I'll give you really quickly a little bit of my personal sales background because I want to not just talk to you about, you know, the, the sales that I did, but the sales that I did in really difficult times because it's easy to sell when the money is flowing. It is easy to sell when nobody's having to think about the transactions that they're going. What is really hard to do it is to create value for people when everybody is saying, <laughs> you can't have my dollars or I'm not sure when the next dollar is going to come up. So I need to save every, every penny that I have. And so when my, my very first sales job was actually working for Xerox during the great recession of 2008 and 2009, I started with them a few years before that. Um, but in the 2008, 2009, it was one of the hardest times to deal with because despite the fact that things have been changing all around us and we're working in photocopiers, we're not talking about mortgages. We're not talking about banking industry everyone said we're not spending a dollar yet despite that I became the number one sales rep of the year out of 121 other reps across the country because of how we were able to help change the conversation with a lot of our clients I'm going to talk to you a little bit today in the questions that we should be asking but ultimately what we did was we focused our clients on the positivity on the future on how amazing things will ultimately be not focusing them on where they are today which was a terrible place to be fear uncertainty and doubt might be a great motivator to get people to take action it's actually the number one motivator to get people to take action but I don't like to play that game I like to use the number two reason which is all the things that you could potentially gain the positivity in 2015 I was working for a company where a lot of our clients were oil and gas type of uh, industries and what ended up happening was when oil and gas prices dipped in 2015 it, they actually dipped even further if only we knew um, but we had a lot of clients come up to us and say we need to reduce our prices with you you need to charge us less for the service that you're providing and instead of just saying yes absolutely we're happy to do that we said whoa 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 we'll work with you but you need to work with us too and we took a look at a holistic view of everything that the company was doing we yes we ultimately changed and reduced our prices on the particular service that they were asking for but we ultimately increased our revenue overall with that account because we looked at all of the other elements that they were spending on and I take give that to you as inspiration for clients that might come back to you and want to negotiate on price because there's bigger things that we can look at 
My company is KO Advantage Group, and we are the only sales process really built on connecting clients with emotional intelligence for high value transactions. We help those create a premium price for your premium services. We help you do this through virtual environments as well. We teach online, we get you to practice online, ultimately helping you to create a better relationship with your clients. And we're working with clients right across coast to coast with, with their own clients across coast to coast without ever having to leave their home office. So we can show you how to do that too. Uh, we give you more sleep because you're able to predict your pet cash flow sizes, what are the deals, what sizes of the deals, and when are they going to close with reliability. Imagine knowing today what you're going to close in November and December. How much nicer will that make Christmas for you if you had that predictability? We want to give that to you. We give you empowerment and knowing which clients to work with and the right times. When do you say no? Right as early as possible. There is nothing worse from a business owner or a sales rep perspective when you have to go ahead and have set meeting number six, seven, eight with somebody only to find out that they weren't even a right fit for you. And we put all of our eggs in that basket. Whereas if you, in hindsight, if you said, if I saw those red flags on meeting number one, I would have never continued on with that. I would have saved myself so much more time. And isn't time the number one biggest resource that all of us wanna have more of? And finally, we're gonna give you less anxiety and way more time going forward. Awesome. Oh uh, yeah, Jim, I wish you, you copy that, your little comment that you put in a chat. I want everybody to see that, but yeah, you're absolutely welcome. Um, so value is created and not learned. And before we go into the questions we want to, to ask, I want you to understand why questions are so important. Because the value you create in a sales cycle is entirely based on the questions that we ask. Now, the other thing that we're finding out, especially in virtual-based environments, in, in a lot of virtual meetings, is not that we're trying to create a lot of value inside a one-hour session. We don't necessarily want to have every single meeting be an hour hour long meeting. There's a lot of value in having your, your virtual meetings, your Zoom facing meetings as a 20 minute or 45 minute meeting, because it's less about the value that is created during the moment that we talk and more about the, the questions that we ask, the thought provoking way that we're leaving the client and then creating the space between the next meeting. Whereas the client is, has one or two nuggets that you've left them out of the whole 45 minutes that you've been sitting there chatting with them, they have one or two things that they're key takeaways that they're, they're taking away. And then we're, they're gonna be thinking about that between Wednesday and Friday, between Wednesday and Tuesday of our next meetings, the value is created in the space between. But it's not because I've told you all this information, but rather I'm leaving you with a question to ponder. And as you're pondering it, you're also thinking of the person who left you with that question. You're thinking that I need to make sure I have an answer for this because when Kim meets me on Tuesday, she's going to ask me what my thoughts are. That is how we ultimately get higher deals, faster closes, and way more conversations going on. I want to give you an example of Julie and her question. So when, I, I told you how we originally did this as a lunch and learn several months back, almost a year now, probably. Um, but Julie was brand new. She was an HR outsourcing consulting company. She was brand new to business. She had left her previous company. She decided she was going to start her own company and she attended specifically this lunch and learn. And she says, Kim, I need to show up to this meeting because I have been invited to the most pivotal meeting of my life. She goes, the, the company has asked three of us to show up. She goes, the other two companies that are showing up, I have like decades of experience, like they have teams and everything else like this. And she goes, I'm just lucky to have the meeting. She goes, the only reason I'm getting the meeting is because somebody had recommended her. Said, listen, I know a friend of a friend that has just started her own HR consulting company. We should really see what she has to say. Now, Julie goes ahead and attends this meeting, takes crazy massive notes, and I hope you have your pen and paper because your hand is going to be sore here in an instant, but she took crazy amounts of notes and she followed up with me the two days after the meeting. And she goes, Kim, it was unbelievable. 
She goes, I just sat there. They asked me for a presentation. And instead of giving a presentation, I took your advice and I just asked them a ton of questions. And she goes, I asked them every single one of these questions that you had asked, you had outlined on that meeting. And she goes, and the next, they asked me to follow up with them the next day. And she goes, and then they told me that they were ultimately awarding me the business. And she goes, because what they said was everyone else was telling them what they thought that they needed, whereas I was the only one that was asking them what they thought they needed. She goes, because of that, they saw this as being more of a relationship and a collaboration going forward. She goes, that was the most valuable hour I have ever spent. So my goal here today for you is that this now becomes the most valuable hour you've ever spent. So we go through various places throughout the entire sales cycle and the buyer's journey. Specifically when it comes to questions, the majority of your time is going to be in these two stages of your sales cycle and your buyer's journey. It's going to be in the lead qualification stage. Do we work with the right people? Are we having the right conversations? And it was slowly going to meld into this value creation stage where we're still continuing to ask a lot of questions. A lot of people get this confused because because they think the value creation phase, also sometimes known as the needs analysis or the value development stage, is often where we tell the clients the value that we provide. Absolutely not, no way. The only time we tell the client the value that we provide is right before we're at the proposal stage. But for now, we need the client to tell us the value. So we, as long as we are in these two stages of your sales cycle, you want to make sure you're asking a lot of questions. At the end of today's webinar, um, I'm going to give you the link to actually download this particular slide, print it off, staple it on your, your wall at your office, rename your sales cycles inside your CRM to these different stages. I promise you, you will be so happy that you did. So let's start off with the questions we should never ask clients. And, and I say this because as a sales rep, as a professionally trained person for Xerox and American Express, every year they would bring in another sales trainer. And every year that sales trainer would make sure that we were focused on asking these types of questions. And every single time I asked the client the questions, I would get yes or no answers. And ultimately I felt like I was go moving the sales cycle forward because I had asked the questions. It turns out these are terrible questions to ask. And the reason why is because it forces the client to give you a yes or no answer. Things like, are you the person making the decision? Yeah, I am. What's it to you? Yes, I'm the, I'm the one who contacted you. I am the person making the decision. What more can you get out of that? Okay, great. When do you need this buy? I don't know. I honestly, I, I wish I had it yesterday, but um, we're here now. So, you know, I'm going to need it or I need it in, in the new year. I need it in January. Awesome. Okay. So we write that down. Are you looking at other companies? Are you looking at others? Um, yeah, we're, we're going to be comp uh, like comparing different prices and solutions. Awesome. Okay. So that tells me in my head that I may have to make sure I'm giving you the lowest price. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is your budget by the way, since we're talking about price? Um, you know what, honestly, I have no idea. Uh, zero? How about zero? Is zero a number that we can work with? And if it's not, I'm going to give you some number that's lower than that. Now, we've gotten some information from the client, but is, does that ultimately help us to create the right solution? Because now I have a yes, I have January, I have a yes, and then I have you know some number that I really can't create a solution for. So am I going to create something out of that? Or should we help develop the client for where they ultimately want to be? Because when it does come to budget, a lot of people focus on the budget questions at the very beginning. If I ask you the price, then we can go ahead and start to create something that fits within that. Now, the other school of thought is a lot of salespeople say never, ever talk about price. I am on the opposite side. I think that price is something that you need to discuss. If it's discussed, if the client asks you at the beginning, be well prepared to give that information. If they don't ask you it, at some point, you're going to have to divulge the information before the proposal. Make sure you're moving that forward. But even if the client does tell you how much they have as a budget, a budget will tell you what you can't afford, but it won't stop somebody from buying it. If I truly need your services, if I feel like you are the best suited person for me and my business, that you are going to help me grow, 
I am going to invest in you no matter what the price is. So there's two types of questions that we will really focus on. The first one is your open-ended questions. Your who, what, where, when, how, and why, right? Why is that so important, right? These are your five W's. The nice thing about changing some of those questions is that ultimately you're getting more information, right? When I ask you who is the decision maker, now I ultimately get, you know, more information. When I ask them, you know, how are you determining your budget? Now I'm getting more information, right? Now let's be clear because even what you saw in there, we had a couple questions. We had when and we had what, but why were they bad? Like they were open-ended questions, Kim. They started with a when, they started with a what. The reason why is because sometimes closed-ended questions will pose as an open-ended question. And how do you know when that happens is because can you answer it with a single word? Can you answer it with one particular thing? Or is there an elaborate statement? Is there more information that you're giving? So majority of your questions want to be open-ended questions. And you'll even see examples as we go through here, how we've taken maybe a, a normal question and turned it into an open-ended question, ultimately getting us more information. Close-ended questions, on the other hand, are usually starting with like the are you, could you, do you, should you, like if you could. If you could find a solution that met all your needs, is that something you would go with? Yeah, okay, right? Like, I mean, that doesn't really give us anything. Close-ended questions are not bad. They are just to be used strategically. And the unfortunate point is that most people, unless they are professionally trained, unless they have really developed that sales skill, will ask majority of their questions as closed-ended questions, which is why I'm so glad that you're here today because you're no longer going to be a part of the majority. You are going to be part of the superiority. You are going to be the top of everybody else. The person that asks the questions owns the conversation. We want to make sure that we are asking questions in order to lead that conversation. If you ever watch legal dramas, right? I'm watching uh, How to Get Away with Murder, right? You know, with a, a Viola Davis, right? She's just such a badass woman. And Viola Davis goes ahead and she's, uh, you know, sitting in court and she's asking all these questions. Who's in control of that conversation? Is it the defendant that's sitting at the stand or is it the lawyer who is asking the questions? It's the lawyer asking the questions because they're helping to steer the conversation. Now, we're not going to go into specifically into other types of levels of questions, such as leading questions, such as, uh, you know, statement questions, you know, those types of things. But I want you to be clear that any time somebody has spent the time crafting and planning out their questions, they know where that conversation is going to go versus somebody who shows up and feels like, well, I'm just gonna wing it. I'm just gonna think that I'm gonna figure it out as I go along. If you want to own the conversation, you need to own the questions, and therefore you need to be planned out in what you're going to ask. So question number one, okay? What is your goal? I know, Kim, this is so simple. It is not that simple. And it is one of the most powerful questions that you should be asking from meeting number one with a client. If you do not ask this client what their goal is, how will either of you ultimately know that you are going to help them get to the next level? If I don't know that your goal is ultimately to expand your business, you know, grow an extra 20%, you know, maybe um, go into two or three different market centers, how do I go ahead and tell you that I'm going to be able to do that? You have to know where the client's goal is because as a sales provider, as a service provider, as a business owner, your only job, you have number one job, your only job is to help me achieve more. If I am not going to achieve more by investing in you, why am I investing in you? Why am I doing that? Right. Let me know, even to put in the chat, you guys, I do have it open. I'm reading what you're, you're doing in there, right? Ask it, like, even say like, yes, this is a question I ask or no, like this is definitely one I want to, to add in there. I want to hear as I'm going through this, am I hitting the nail on the head for some of you, right? We want to know why they want that. Now, the other nice thing about asking people what their goal is, 
is that hopefully it actually starts that financial conversation. And not that we're going to be having them tell us, well, my goal is to spend as little money as possible with you. That's probably not their goal. What their goal is, is to actually drive a revenue, is to actually drive a number of clients, is to be the, the top 50 employer in the tri-state area, whatever it is. And by understanding that, now we create a bigger picture with the client. And when we eventually get to the pricing conversation, because we have crafted this amazing big picture, we are able to carve out a small piece of that pie. Because if a client tells me that their goal is to hit a million dollars, a million dollars in revenue, whether that's an annual or a monthly or a weekly number, I don't really care. But my goal is to hit a million dollars. And I tell them that we're going to help them achieve that goal. And it's going to cost them $100,000 to get there. Without reference point to that million dollars, $100,000 sounds like a massive number. <gasps> There's no way I'm investing in that. But when I can go back to the client and say, well, if $100,000 helps you get to that million dollars, is that a worthwhile investment? By having the comparison, now we're ultimately able to help our clients grow and expand. Who else will be part of this decision? Who else? So I crossed out there, are you the decision maker? I never want any one of you to ever ask that question again. That is a terrible question, but rather who else? We want to respect the person that is sitting in front of us and we want to appreciate their role in the ultimate decision, whether they are the decision maker or whether they're the influencer. I'm not going to get into all the other stages. Honestly, it doesn't matter to me. I just want to focus on those two roles. You're either a decision maker or you're an influencer. But decision makers, right, often will have an influencer. In my company, right, as president and CEO of KO Advantage Group, I'm the ultimate decision maker. I'm the one, are you the decision maker? Yes, yes I am. And I could be having a lot of conversations with somebody and I could be like, go, 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 whoa. And the person's like, what just happened? Because I'm the decision maker, I also want to hear the opinions of others. Am I choosing to make this investment? I could be talking to my teammates, right? Someone on my team could say, you know what? I didn't hear really good things about that company. Or you know what? Maybe we'd be better spent to invest the money somewhere else. Or you know what? Maybe let's hold off on that decision. I could be having a conversation with my husband at the dinner table. And he says, you know what? I think that this is actually something that you probably should focus your business on. And despite the fact that I am the ultimate decision maker and I felt very confident about making this decision, the influencers have ultimately helped to sway my decision. By asking who else is going to be a part of the decision, now we can find out how many other conversations are going to happen. How do we have to try to convince somebody that this is the future, that this is the best thing to invest in, that you waiting is probably not being the right decision ultimately. When would you like to see the, um, this complete? Or when would you like to see the result? So this is a great question and we need to ask this as early on as possible. This question is the difference between sales cycles being stalled or delayed or in that terrible abyss of the no-go, right? They fall off the face of the planet, right? Because nobody knows when they want to see the result. And it's different from when do you want to start? Because when do you want to start? I want to start as soon as possible. I want to start in the new year. I want to start when I have the money. I want to start then. That was a great time to start. But the reality is, is that if we were talking about losing weight, nobody wants to start losing weight. Nobody wants to start putting themselves on a diet or start working out four days a week. Nobody wants to do that. What they ultimately want is the result. They want to already have the weight gone. They want to have the weight gone because they have a wedding coming up, because they have a reunion coming up, because they have something. I want people to see how amazing and beautiful I am. That's, when I, that's why I want the result. And when we go from when they want to see the result, and the result might be actually past when your project is going to be finished. But by focusing on that, ultimately what we do is we move them backwards and backwards and backwards where that today 
or two weeks from today or a very short period of time is when they need to start the decision. Now we're telling them when they want to start based on the information that they got on when they wanted to see the result. This ultimately worked for me this year. Um, I was working with a sales cycle and, and things were going really well and they were trying to get in front of the decision maker and they couldn't get the decision maker. He says, Kim, honestly, we have to wait on this because I just can't get in front of the decision maker. And I said, listen, Lee, I know one of the things you said was really important to you was that you wanted to see the results before Memorial Day. Is that still the case? And he says, yeah. And I said, and we're fine to delay this decision, but by delaying this decision, you're not going to get to your result by Labor Day or by Memorial Day. It's going to be even longer than that. <gasps> oh. Okay, okay, we're moving forward on this. So I am definitely gonna make sure that I talk to my decision maker like this week. We're, we're, this is happening, Kim, right? We're not delaying this decision because we can't delay the result. Focus on the result and ultimately you're gonna be able to move the sales cycles faster. How will you measure our success? I like to look at this as the return on investment question, right? How will you know that it was a valuable investment? One of the biggest questions people will come to me is, Kim, how do I quantify return on investment? How do I show my clients that the investment that they made is worth it, that it's going to provide them a result? And I'm like, why are you asking me that? I'm not your client. The only person that we should know who's going to get the result or how they're going to measure that result is the person who is going to see the result. It's the client. Clients will buy when they know that this investment is going to lead them to more. I'm going to invest in this, ultimately getting me a result, which will then lead to more. So in the case of, you know, the uh, sales training, right? I mean, people want to invest in sales training because by having that, that's ultimately going to get me faster transactions, higher dollars, more clients. Yeah, that's a worthwhile investment. How am I going to measure that? Well, I'm going to see that my transactions are going to be higher. How much higher? I don't know, 20% percent higher. Awesome. I'm going to have more clients. How many more clients? I don't know. Let's say an extra, you know, 10 clients a month. Awesome. Right. Um, that we're going to see, you know, clients in new geographies, which geographies I want to get specific with them, right? Marketing can do this too. Marketing is like one of those, you know, I pick it out of nowhere. But if we go to somebody, let's say in marketing, right, and they say, how do I quantify, you know, click ads, right? It's like, well, what do they ultimately want to say? Why are they doing the ads? What are they ultimately hoping to see out of those ads? Oh, I guess they want more meetings. Awesome. How is that meeting going to translate for them? Well, what's the average client worth? And now you start to dig and you continue to ask. Well, when I understand that an average client is worth $10,000 and that, you know, for every four meetings that they get, it's going to translate into one additional client. It is easy for me as a client to say, if I invest $2,000 to get me four meetings, which should hopefully translate into $10,000 in revenue, that's how I will know that this was a successful project. How will you measure a success? How will you know this was a success? Now, as we move away from some of those lead qualification questions, and those are just a few, we want to focus more on the future. We're moving into the value creation phase. And when, the way we want to look at this is in the needs portion. Why does somebody need to do this? Now, let's be very clear. Most people don't need your products or services. Unless you are selling somebody water in a desert or oasis, and that water is going to be critical to their survival, they probably don't need your services. Nobody needs click ads. Nobody needs to have an HR outsourcing company. Nobody needs to have sales training. What they need to have is higher revenue, is happier employees and higher retention. I need to have more leads coming into my business, which will ultimately help me and my survival. Now, when we think about this from an, an airline standpoint, right, airlines will typically do this. So you'll have Delta Airlines that will go ahead and say, hey, guess what? We're still flying. And not only are we still flying, but we're flying right now to Cancun. And you're like, oh, my goodness. I live in Philadelphia right now, and it is going to be really cold really fast, right? You know, like November is coming and it's probably going to snow by that time. I had better get like figure out what I'm going to do because it's a long cold winter. And they said, that's okay because we fly you to Cancun and we're going to get you to Cancun and you are going to be sitting on this beach 
and it is going to be the most beautiful beach that you've ever seen with the white sands and the ocean breeze and you can walk around with a mojito or a margarita in your hand isn't that amazing you're like yes yes awesome i i want to get there philly is going to be cold you know cancun is going to be amazing how do we get there and they said awesome now what the airline does not do is they don't focus you on what it is you they sell they don't focus you on the uh, uh the opera like so the um the experience of showing up to the airport they don't focus you on having to get onto the plane they don't focus you on the fact that you're going to have to be sitting in an airplane for five and a half hours that is ultimately what you are buying but the reasons why they don't focus you on that is because that's actually not what you want to buy nobody wants to buy an airplane experience right unless maybe you're a private jet but nobody wants to buy the airplane experience they go through the airplane experience because what they ultimately want is the beach vacation and so this goes to the idea of that goal but we, the whole idea in the value creation stage is to continuously focus them on the beach on how amazing it will be how glorious it will be and focus them away from how terrible the um the staying in philadelphia would be and at no point do we talk about the solution at no point do we does the airline does delta say listen if we had an opportunity to for you to fly you know for the next four be stuck in an in a tin can for the next four and a half hours um was that something that you would jump on probably not but if they said listen in about four and a half hours if you could be on a beach for a week is that where you would want to be you're like yeah but delta airlines wipes their hands clean the moment you get off that airplane because it is not about the airplane it is about the beach vacation so we want to juxtapose these two things we want to focus them on the current stage right where are they right now and then we will talk about where they want to be and by getting those emotional conversations to to compare them we get to a point where we have to change so the first thing is like kind of what happens and i put in brackets here in six months and three months in a year whatever time frame you want to use it's actually better when we give them a time frame specifically if your product or service goes through a certain time frame now i I don't want you to focus on the product or service time frame itself. What I want you to focus on is what is longer than that product or service time frame. So for instance, let's say you are an HR outsourcing consultant and we want somebody on a recurring revenue model. It's less about them trying to get finished with hiring us and more about what's going to happen, let's say in six months when it's spring and they have to go on hiring right now how do we get them right um if you're a marketing agency and then you're going ahead and you're saying listen we're going to post all these ads and everything and we're going to run ads for about six weeks i don't want them to focus on the six weeks i want to focus on the three months what happens on the additional six weeks after the ads are finished running or after we have finessed the conversation something a little bit longer than the period of time that we're going to be working with them so what happens in six months if it's if this if you don't take any change now the reality is is that we don't actually have to tell our clients how bad it could get a lot of sales people will want to go into the conversations around fud fear uncertainty and doubt right if i focus the person on fud they're going to be forced to make a decision and yes dr robert cialdini in his book influence said this was absolutely right except people are really tired of fud it is the number one reason why most of us will make a decision but it's exhausting it's exhausting to have someone tell me how bad it is and if you don't believe me try watching an hour of political ads right one side telling you the fearful things and the other side telling you fearful things and you're just exhausted by the end of it whereas the person that sets themselves apart is the hopeful person but not that we tell the person how bad it could be, get, but rather that we ask them and let them tell us. Because the reality is, is by having you ask me the question, I'm going to tell you what my deepest fears already are. I'm going to tell you what I'm afraid of. And it might be just as bad, it might be worse than what you thought it could be. 
but I promise you, your client has already gone through their worst case scenario. They've already imagined it. And now you're just opening it up to that conversation so that they can tell you what they want to avoid, what they want to avoid, not what you think they should avoid. And then we go to the other side. So if this is how bad things could get or where you will be by staying in the status quo, maybe we're just stagnant. If, I, if we're not growing, we're dying, which will ultimately get there as well. Where should the opposite look like? What should the opposite happen? What would your ideal state look like? Where does your client want to be? And how are you going to support your clients in getting closer to those goals? Tell me, what would it look like? right? Going to the same level of how will you measure the success. Now we want to take them away from just, you know, understanding how much bigger it could be to actually articulating this. Let's take that imagination and let's get them to articulate what this will be. And by using that imagination and bringing it out, this is where the clients will naturally sell themselves because they're telling you what they think it should look like. And you're just in agreement. You're just nodding along the ways. Whereas if we tell our clients what the solution will look like, we take away the imagination. We tell, it's like the same as telling somebody what they should dream. That's not fun. Whereas when we ask them, they're like, this is what it could look like, or this is how it could be. And you're like, yeah. And what else? And what else? And how much more? And we start digging into that. And now you're the catalyst of someone else's dreams. Imagine how that would feel in your sales cycles. How many more conversations you could ultimately get. How many more clients you could ultimately help when you start to change them. Who else, what else are you considering? This is a great conversation started to understand where are we sitting in the giant value price quality triangle? What else are we looking at? Who else are you looking at? Now, the, the thing about competition is oftentimes we're not in competition with people just like us. I am in oftentimes not in competition with other sales training companies. I am in competition with marketing agencies. I'm in competition with customer experience conversations. I am in competition with hiring a sales manager. There's a lot of different things that I'm in competition with. Each road gets us to the same ultimate destination. And when I understand what the client ultimately wants the solution to look like, well, how would you measure that success? Well, we want more leads. Great, let's talk about leads because marketing can get you leads. Sales can also produce leads. Um, client experience and getting a really good referral network can also ultimately get you leads. And we need to understand how this conversation is ultimately happening and the client's perspective. In the, the show, The Office, this is a perfect example where they, were, they had the surplus budget. And they're like, okay, what do we spend the surplus budget on? Do we spend it on a copier? Do we spend it on chairs? Or does Michael Scott end up taking the bonus? There's three different things that we're ultimately competing against. It wasn't an episode about this chair versus this chair or this chair. It wasn't a conversation about this copier or this copier or this copier, but three completely separate decisions, ultimately helping the, the entire office to boost and increase morale. The other thing that you might see in this as a competitor is not that I necessarily am looking at spending money, but rather do we choose to invest in you or do we just figure it out on our own? Do we go ahead and choose to just keep everything in house? And by understanding how else that conversation is happening, now we can talk to them about the benefits of making one decision versus another decision. Why going with us versus going with a competitor or why going with us versus doing it in house is actually a better thing. Because if you don't have to spend all that time, money and energy trying to figure it out on your own, what could you be spending that time, money, and energy on? How will that pot uh, potentially impact your business? What is that positive return of four hours of your time? And now we're creating sales cycles. And now we're showing the client how by investing some money with us, the alternative of spending no money is ultimately a better decision to spend with us because the time that they're saving 
can help them to grow their business, grow more revenue, grow more clients, grow more profitability. And whew, that's a way better investment. Why is this important? This is absolutely one of my favorite questions to ask. And I feel like not enough people ask this question. Why is this important? Because we want to make sure that we are connecting with people on why they need to make this decision, that need, that gut, like that uh, visceral type of conversation. What is this going to do for you? What is this going to do for you as a leader of your organization? What is this going to do for your impact in your local economy? What is this going to do for you as a parent, as a, as a innovator, as someone that we want to follow? Why is that important? When we connect with the reasons why we want to make a decision, what it will mean to us, what it will mean to our legacy, what it will mean to, to our impact on the world, it starts to increase in the ranking of importance. We continuously focus on those projects and things that were going to help our business if it ultimately helps us to grow, if it ultimately helps us to do something bigger than just this project. And when something new shows up, which it always will, there will be a new shiny thing, something cheaper, something faster, something more, more urgent than just this thing. The one thing that will stay true is that as long as this is important, we will spend our time and energy on it. We will focus on the things that are most important to us. Get your client to tell you why it is important that we focus on this, and it will always sit at the top of the priority. When we ask the questions, the answers people give us is their truth. It helps to reinforce why they're doing what they're doing. <sighs> how would that feel? I'm this girl, I'm like, yes, how would this feel? So the, the biggest thing that's actually going to help to speed up your sales cycle is around emotional intelligence, right? Is around the empathy, the emotions behind we make a decision. And it gets really powerful when we compare not just where a client will be in six months if nothing changes, to what they would like to see their ideal state look like. But when we tack on how that would feel, now we can really create a conflict between those two emotions. When our heads, we can logically discuss why we can wait for that ideal solution and why we should not, like why we're okay to hold on to ourselves at this current state just a little bit longer. But when you tap in emotions, you feel it bubble up. There's something in you that says, I must make changes to this today. And when I, somebody tells me that in, if nothing changes in the next six months, like, well, you know, it's just nothing will change or we'll just be, we'll be the same, right? We'll probably be generating the same amount of revenue as we always have. You could be like, well, that's great. And how would that feel? Well, I mean, it, it would feel all right, you know. Uh, I know one of the things you said was that you wanted to be, be growing your business. You wanted to have that second location open before the end of this year. When you have that second location open this year, how will that feel? Oh my goodness, that would be incredible. Like that would be the most amazing thing that I've ever, awesome, awesome. And if that didn't happen, how would that feel? Oh, well, I mean like, I, I uh, okay. And knowing that the things you could have done today will help you to get there and you didn't take that action, how will you feel about that? Oh. <sighs> and you can watch in real time as the client is convincing themselves that now they need to take action to get there. It also helps to invite deeper connections because I promise you, there aren't a lot of value providers out there that are asking somebody about their feelings. We trust our gut. Malcolm Gladwell wrote all about this in his book, Blink. We trust our gut to do something. Tell your client what their gut says. What does your gut say about making this decision? 
and find out what their truth ultimately is. People will always buy on emotion and then justify with logic. A perfect example, I mean, just watch politics. And I'm not going to tell you one candidate or one party over another, but what you will see is that if I am emotionally charged, if I emotionally decide that this person, this party is my person, right, I will find the headlines and the news media that reflects that emotional state. I will read and take in the information that logically convinces me why that emotion needs to be the same. And we do the same in business. We emotionally decide the right directions that we need to. And then we search for the answers that are gonna help us to get there. And then our, finally, kind of our first close on the question. Was this valuable to you? And I also, I want to pose this one actually even to, to you, all of you that are listening on today. Was this valuable to you? Okay. I love closing my meetings by asking people, was this valuable to you? And this is going to be more critical today than it ever has been before. Because as we continue to move a lot more of our meetings to that virtual environment, when things open up and we're allowed to have face-to-face -face meetings again and interactions, I truly believe that we're not going to completely move away from this virtual environment. We're going to have to be much more concise and um, intentional with the questions and the way we spend our time in the meetings. Our meetings are ultimately going to also be shorter. We're gonna be able to do more in 20 minutes or 45 minutes that we would have done in an hour when we're sitting face to face with somebody. So if I am going to leave you and I'm ultimately going to ask you for a second meeting, I am ultimately asking you as you know, attendees of this webinar for another webinar to attend, I also wanna ask you, was this valuable to you? Was this valuable for you? And I want the person to give me a resounding yes. Now, if they say no, I also want that because I want to know how can I make this better? How do I consistently improve myself? You can also follow this up with what did you take away from today's meeting? What is the one thing that you're going to do? What are you going to do next? And get the person to show you, actually articulate to you why this was valuable to them, because that ultimately helps you to be better and better at your skill set. Because that means if the one thing that they took away was the most valuable piece, you want to make sure that every single meeting that's either before that or new meetings or subsequent to that focuses on the thing that that person found most valuable and that they're willing to do next time. <sighs> I hope you enjoy that new version of it. I really, I really love it. Um, Nabil uh, wants to give you a testimonial. He says, listen, I really feel like you've underpriced your program for the value he's received. We do a 12 week program, um, but it is where we've actually completely changed ourselves because we are now a subscription based model. Cameron, an engineer and engineers, especially when we're talking about feelings, he's like, ah, oh, none of this works. But he sent me a message shortly after watching this presentation with some of the questions. He went right after um, uh, the, this conversation to going to a stalled client and saying, asking these questions, moved them to close. And he sent me a message saying it was like magic or something. Th those questions that you gave me, I asked them, and all of a sudden the client told me that they were actually ready to buy. Now we do have a subscription-based sales training. We are the only sales company, as far as I know, that is subscription-based. Take what you need, cancel when you're, you're done, continue on if you want to be a part of the tribe. And we start for as low as the $50 a month. We do team um, trainings for $2,100 a month. You can get two people two people for $500 a month. So you and one other person, whether that's a friend, whether that's a colleague, whether that is maybe a brand new employee that you know needs to have sales training. And the nice thing about having it as a subscription base is you can switch out those people at any given time. As long as you're an active subscriber, you can switch them out. If you have a, a bigger team, I look at the 12 person goal plan. But I, before, before we even go into that, I wanna make sure that I can provide you incredible value. Because if I can't provide you incredible value with 20 minutes, I don't deserve you. I don't deserve to have you as a subscriber. So I invite you 
to go to our meeting link at bit.ly slash KO meeting and book 20 minutes with myself, with Mike on my team, and we'll be happy to help you with whatever you need. And maybe that is all that you need. Why are we happy to walk away with after only 20 minutes? Because when I first started sales, I followed somebody named Zig Ziglar. Now LinkedIn called me their most influential sales leader to follow. And Zig Ziglar is my most influential sales leader to follow. And I believe in this so much that we actually changed our entire company to have this as our number one value. You can have everything you want in life if you help enough people get what they want. That's it. We want to help you as a business owner, as a salesperson, as somebody who's potentially growing to get those clients, to get that revenue, to get those higher dollars. Because ultimately, that helps entrench our place in the world. But don't wait, because Rob wants to give you something. He says, listen, the longer you wait, that's revenue you're missing out on. Now, if you're not quite ready to book a meeting with us, you can go ahead and get the slides. We're gonna email them to you afterwards. So thank you so much for attending um, this presentation live, as well as recording to today's presentation. But you can also get that entire one page slide, the entire sales cycle, so that you know where the steps are in your own sales cycle. Are you touching every single piece? Because I can tell you with 100% certainty, when people don't get the deal, it's usually because they skipped over a step because they avoided it. So I want to make sure that no matter what, you have the right steps in your own sales process. If you go to kimorleski.com slash KO webinars, you can download that. But I invite you to ask yourself critically, how much more could you get in the next 30 days if you took one action? All right, this is me. Thank you so much. Um, this is my third book, Sell More Faster. That is me with my best friend, Oprah Winfrey. Um, she doesn't know that she's my best friend, but I, I've been best friends with her since I was uh, no taller than a knee height on a grasshopper. Uh, I am also Startup Canada's Female Entrepreneur of the Year and Success Magazine's Most Inspirational Blogger. What's one thing that you're walking away with? Okay. Did you find this valuable? What is one thing that you, what was the most valuable thing that you got out of today? I see the chat is already flying like fire. I love it. I love it. Um, yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Ce uh, Cecilia, Thomas. Yes. Um, Susan. Yes, absolutely. Um, Tasha, thank you. Absolutely. Greg. Oh, you're absolutely welcome, Greg. Jim. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, Tarkin, Cecilia. Nizi, Greg, oh, you are all so, so, I'm so grateful to have you here today. I know that you had options in your, in your day, right? That there's a better thing. There's a lot of things, not better things. Honestly, I hope this was, there was nothing as, as great as today. Um, I know that there was a lot of things that you had to do in your calendar. And I am incredibly grateful that you chose to spend this time with me and with my team here today. So one more time for the, the download and go ahead and get the slides, right? Um, by going to kimorleski.com slash KO dash webinar. If you have any questions about this, go ahead and even put those in the chat as well. Um, I'm gonna keep the chat open for just another uh, minute longer or so. It was an absolute pleasure. To, to have you. And then please, for those of you that are using these, uh, these tips on your calls, Cecilia, um, you know, Nizi, anybody else like that, please go ahead and, um, and let me know afterwards. What was the result of that meeting? How did that meeting feel for you afterwards? Because I, I know that I had a lot of people come back to me and say, oh, that felt so much better. That meeting felt so much more natural than anything else I could do. And if I can do that for you in one meeting, imagine what it would feel like to be able to have that feeling throughout your entire sales process, right from getting and acquiring new prospects all the way to closing deals for more money than you've ever had before. Oh, 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Garth. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Rick, everyone. I very much appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome, Jim. <laughs> uh, you're absolutely welcome. Thank you. Thank you all so much.